Charles Davis in a rush shirt. Thanks for coming out on Who's a. Um, <laughs> I'm just gonna start with Happy Halloween. Mm. Happy Halloween. Uh, are you all sufficiently creeped out enough to like have good Halloween costumes? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so this is Charles. He came up from New York. He's super cool. He's 33. He's an, in yes, he's an independent filmmaker <laughs> who lives in New York. Who, New Jersey. Sorry, New Jersey. Close enough. Um, he makes movies. Yeah. Like. Like, the hardest thing in the world is putting movies on screen. So, we were just talking about this. So, like, I know you just watched one of the weirdest films you've ever seen. Um, ask him all the questions that you want about that. Um, ask him about how he makes his money, how he funds his films. Like, ask him, you guys make films, right? Like, yeah, I'm shutting up. Charles is awesome. Oh, I was just going to say that's the only horror movie I've ever seen besides, like, Blair Witch and Carnival Mind for me. So. Oh, really? Yeah. Okay. What would you think? <laughs> I think you at the beginning you said like you wanted it to feel like nightmares mm -hmm. and it did. Yeah. So you did a good job. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Yeah, I mean yeah, a lot of the stuff I'm influenced by, um I think with horror particularly I know it's not really a question, but I'll take it as a question. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but um with horror particularly I think um uh one thing you kinda learn is that uh, it's really impossible to tell what's going to scare other people, so you sort of have to go with what scares yourself. And for me the thing that scares me is nightmares I have and sort of just images that pop in my mind. So um, that's sort of what it, sort of, that's the stuff I like. And the movies that like kind of frighten me when I think about them, the movies that kind of gave me the biggest scares were, I mean, obviously, I'm a huge, if you guys know anything about David Lynch, I'm a huge, obviously, I'm a huge David Lynch. I was just gonna say, yeah, there's a huge, so proud. there's some call outs in this film for that, but the stuff I love about it is just how you feel like you're watching a dream or a nightmare or something like that. I'm a really big fan. There's a poster you have downstairs of Videodrome, which I would say is a pretty big influence on that. If you want to see some of my influences, I'd say watch the movie Lost Highway and watch the movie Videodrome. And they're both sort of work on what some people call dream logic or nightmare logic if it's a horror movie. Mm -hmm. um, and it's sort of that idea where it's 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 it, it acts like, you know, your, your, your mind and it acts, um, it sort of interprets like that. So to me, that was, that's that's what I was going for. I'm glad you felt that. Um, because that's sort of what I wanted, because that's the stuff that freaks me out, you know. I can get in more depth of that, too, because I'm, I'm really into Carl Jung. I don't know if you guys know who that is at all, but he was, he was all about, like, dream interpretation and mm -hmm. symbolism and stuff like that as well, so there's some there's a bit of that in there, too. Yeah, yeah, Jung, Jung was Freud's apprentice who yeah. eventually turned on Freud, so... Yeah. Well, or maybe you could say Freud turned on him. <laughs> yeah, fair enough. Fair enough. Interesting, when we talk about Videodrome, the guy who made that is a guy named David Cronenberg, and he made a movie about Freud and Jung called uh, A Dangerous Method, which is a very, not a horror movie at all, but it's actually a really interesting film. Um, if you want to see <laughs> the weirdest sex scenes in your life between Michael <laughs> Fassbender and um, uh, uh, Kieran Knightley, uh, that's a good film to watch. <laughs> well, which movie? Uh, a Most Dangerous Method. Okay. It's about Carl Jung. Or a, a dangerous life. method. It's about Carl Jung and, and, and Freud back in. Hey, we're getting way off topic. It's not. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I like Fassman. Yeah. They mentioned Cronenberg. I like his movies quite a bit. Like The Fly. Is it, is it the. Yeah, he's made The Fly. He made The Fly. He made um, uh, Scanners. Who did, made, uh, who did Society? I want to danger. Yeah. Society? Yeah. I don't know Society. Yeah, that's not a body horror one. one. Yeah. Yeah. That's Brian Hughes now who made that yeah. one. He's a big influence on me, too. Mm -hmm. so, enough, so, yeah. so, questions about yeah. Eddie Glum. Like, what. What did you just experience? Uh, do you know Red Letter Media? Hmm? Red Letter Media. Red Le no, I don't know them. Oh, okay. Uh, they're, they're known for um, the Plinkett uh, Star Wars prequels reviews. Mm -hmm. uh, th th there's a character named Mr. Plinkett mm -hmm. uh, who's uh, very similar to Eddie Glum. Ah. And uh, he's, he's kind of insane and murderer. Mm -hmm. And he's the one that's like reviewing the Star Wars movie. <laughs> so it's like a, it's a bit of a dark humor. Yeah. It's like, uh, it's like 
Mm. Like, there's a scene where uh, in one of his reviews, he's like talking about Star Wars and like the Phantom Menace, and he's like, "Oh, uh, come downstairs into my basement. Uh, where I, my my grandkids have those stupid Star Wars toys." And like you see in the basement, and, and like yeah. as as he pans, you see like someone like tied up in the corner. <laughs> but, like he just like is like, "Oh, look at this stupid Jar Jar toy." Yeah. Like that, so that sort of reminded me of that the, well, yeah. the, the so, character. <laughs> so for me, like one of the more important moments in this film is that fairly subtle moment where he's like they come in through the front door they come in through the front door and then there's a moment where the front door is open and we hear sort of like normal life mm-hmm. like the real yes. can, you, can you like did you guys all catch that yeah like, yeah. Did, that's, yeah like important like horns right? and yeah can you talk about that like what is yeah. what is that what is that well, I'm not yeah, going to tell you I'm not going to tell you blatantly what it is well I mean there is um, yeah yeah so I might deflect that so one thing about that is I don't want to blatant when this film is abstract as this Mm-hmm. I don't want to blatantly explain mm-hmm. sort of what everything means because those are, I mean, I think that's asked me so I bring up this topic, but um, I had a very specific thing in my mind. Obviously, there's more going on in the film with things like that, with things like the subtitles changing mm-hmm. on you and stuff like that. There's more going on than yeah. what you're seeing, and that's what I was trying to achieve is the idea that there's more to the story than was just what you're blatantly seeing, giving you clues. Um, I had something very, very specific in my mind when I made it, and I don't want to tell anybody about it because... What has happened to me since I made this film is that people will come up to me and be like, well, what's going on, what's going on? And they'll be like, what's going on? Tell, you tell me what you think is going on. And 90% of the time, every single person, what they come up in their own heads is like infinitely better than what, what I had in my head to the point where I think what I had in my head now was kind of lame and I don't want to explain it because, <laughs> so, um, you know, one thing I'll tell, uh, I mean, so this isn't what was in my head, but, um, but anyway, this is why, I, well, the point is that this is why. It's a good story, it's a good story. Yeah, it's a good story, but my friend Luke saw it and he had, and this is an example because I thought this was a great idea, I'm like, it wasn't my idea at all, but I think it's a great better idea, which is that um, with the outside world is that way, what he had pieced here in his mind was that Eddie Glum is like this disturbed guy who doesn't fit in society and he's sort of like this dominating kind of dangerous person and then he finds walks into this house one day and finds himself in this nightmare world and it's like you have the front door and it's sort of like this portal uh from the normal world to the front the, the nightmare world and the thing with him though is he's so disturbed that he likes being in the nightmare world because it's like he can like dominate people he can be evil he can be all these other things that you know this the shadow side of himself that he's not able to express in in the normal world and that's why, you know, he lives in this world and he likes it there, even though it's dangerous. And that was sort of his idea um, of what that front door is, why you hear things, things are different outside the front door than the other doors. So, mm-hmm. again, that wasn't what I had in my head at all, but I thought it was like, that's a fantastic <laughs> idea, and I love that idea. And this is, I, I'm just telling you, because I, I, I love this idea that people can, can sort of interpret it themselves and sort of piece together the story themselves. That's sort of something I, I wanted to achieve with the film is that you can go and you can talk to your friends about what do you think is going on. Um, and you can kind of vote and it sort of becomes participatory a bit. And, the, and it's like when I made the movie that wasn't necessarily what I had in mind is making something like that, but that's sort of what, when I was editing it and finishing the film, that's sort of what it ended up becoming. So um, I've had a few people I've told blatantly what's going on um, and I've regretted it ever since because again, then they're like, oh, well, I had this other idea and I guess that's not anymore. Because I find when you blatantly explain things to people, it sort of ruins. They just so they just accept it. It's like, oh, that's it's it. And you know, now that I've made the film and heard other people's ideas, I'm like, I'm not sure what I was originally thinking is what it is anymore. I sort of like I like yeah. these other ideas everyone else is having about well, it. Well, but so. this, I mean, it, it happens a lot. This like, is this is the moment where you have the director of the film in the room. If you want to try out your theories, now is the time to yeah. like bounce them off him and see what <laughs> sticks. Oh. I'm not saying you have. I'm just. Oh yes, background. Well. Um, I only saw like the last five minutes, mm-hmm. but um, I noticed like the American flag and the um, the last scene in the cemetery, mm-hmm. and like I just thought of like veterans and war, mm-hmm. and I'm not like a hundred percent sure why. Mm-hmm. And then like when the person started screaming, that just sort of like Stressed triggered out, yeah. me a little bit. <laughs> I was like, oh boy, gotta go. <laughs> but it was yeah. um, that's what I. Mm. Yeah, that's interesting. I never, I never, I didn't even pick that up before. Uh, that there was uh, an allegory for like veterans or something like that. That's an interesting thought. I never, yeah. I mean, yeah. Is this supposed to take place in New Jersey, that your hometown, like in your home state, or is it supposed to take place in the Midwest? Because I felt like this mm-hmm. feeling, this guy is like this, um, you know, that Mer- American documentary. You know, I feel like that type of guy. He's like this Wisconsin kid. You mm-hmm. know, this young, you know, like 
I'm going to throw out like a Trump support. He seems like a country boy, though. Yeah, like yeah. A, hey, you know. Yeah, like, yeah. When you did the subtitles, that's when I start feeling. Uh, were you doing that for the, um, so the audience understands his accent, or are you doing that for intentionally, what was the purpose of this? Yeah. I'm, I'm a big fan of subtitles. Yeah. In general, I have to have subtitles for any film. Yeah, because did you notice that yeah. the subtitles stopped? Yeah, at one point they did. Yeah, no. Did I, you notice where it said, this is one that we catches the first, did you notice the first change? Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You're in a coma, and, and we're yeah. trying to get. Okay, that's cool. Because yeah. a lot of people don't pick that up. Yeah. Really? yeah. Yeah, yeah. A lot up. of people sure didn't. Because oh, they, 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 they said up. the reason yes, I told is that they wait. said they could actually understand what he was saying during that part, so they didn't. So the <laughs> subtitles is an interesting story. And this is tells you. This is one thing to keep in mind when you're making films: is that be, particularly when you're like making an independent film, where you have complete control over everything. Be malleable with yourself and be um, uh, able to adjust things on the go because the subtitles were not originally in the script. Oh, that was added afterwards. After so what happened, I'll tell you what happened kind of from a technical standpoint. Again, <laughs> things developed in my head. This kind of sub-layer of the story kind of developed in my head during the editing process after we had filmed everything because we had, the film was completely shot. And I said, I can't understand what the hell I'm saying in it. <laughs> like, I'm like, I'm talking with this crazy accent. By the way, you're talking about, it reminded you of that, that character. The one thing people have always told me is that it reminds them of... Um, Salad Fingers? Uh, uh, salad <laughs> finger. I know salad yeah. fingers. You know, so that was like when I was in college. That was like ten years ago. Wow, I'm impressed. Uh, <laughs> um, uh, no, yeah, yeah, yeah in, uh, in a sling blade. Sling blade. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, And this is the thing. I've never seen sling blade before in my life, and I showed this film because wow. I, you know, I made this movie. And there's like eight thousand different references of David Lynch, and I thought, oh, that's everyone's going to take me a task over as I'm dumping David Lynch over the place. But no one's mentioned that. Everyone's like, oh, sling blade, sling blade, and I'm like, I don't even know what this. I've never seen this movie before in my life. Yeah. It was like, and you but, didn't even um, know until I told you that there's two of them. <laughs> yeah, no. So my, my my goal with it was I wanted to make uh, my the initial idea of this was to make Forrest Gump's evil brother, twin <laughs> brother, and have a horror movie about Forrest Gump, which is that why his name is Glum Gump Glum. Like it's, oh, it was like Forrest Gump's evil twin brother <laughs> Eddie Glum. That's really and I came up with this initial idea when I was eating uh, Mexican food uh, when we were finished my last film with my makeup artist. Um, but anyway. Um, you're asking a question. I, I, I know you have a question. You, uh, 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 you're asking. Oh, the um, the subtitles happened yeah. because I couldn't understand what I was say, what I was saying. So I was like, all right, I need subtitles on him because you just can't. I like the performance, but I can't understand what I'm saying in it. And I was doing the subtitles and I got bored. <laughs> um, and I was like, um, uh, like maybe there's something interesting going on here. Do you guys? Any guys play play video games at all? Yeah. You guys ever heard about a video game maker called Hideo Kojima, who's yeah. known yeah. for doing a Metal Gear Solid and stuff like that? I'm a huge fan of his, and I was sort of sat there and been like, what would Hideo Kojima do in this situation? And um, one thing he's known for in his video games is he does complete fourth wall breaking constantly. So it's and he does things where it's like areas you think you are safe, you are not safe in. So like you'll be in a menu, like in the game, right? And normally you think like, oh the game's paused and then suddenly the game will keep playing and things will be happening and like to, be, to play the game you have to go into the menu and use the menu in ways you weren't supposed to be using it and so it's like you're still in the game when you think you're out of it and that was sort of where the concept for me came from I think because it was like what if you, you, you always watch subtitles you trust the subtitles are telling you what's going on what if something what if they didn't what if you're still you're still in the game of the movie when you're not watching the subtitles and that's where I had this idea that what if the subtitles start talking to you as the viewer and you start like you're mm -hmm. a participant in the story as well, and that's where the initial idea came from. Mm -hmm. That and this all happened in the editing, just while I was editing it. Um, in terms of the Midwestern question, um, I didn't really have it in any specific area. I just had to be like a crazy guy. Yeah. Um, I, I think it could take place anywhere. Yeah, we filmed it in New Jersey, and we filmed the parts in the bowling alley um, and in the woods up in the Adirondacks. Mm -hmm. um, I like that. It was a great location. Oh yeah, yeah. That was actually because uh, the the actress um, Hope, um, who who plays Diane, she she worked there. <laughs> and, and was able to get us access to it uh, for free. So there you go. And then she also found the mannequins because she was friends with a person who owned a store in the Adirondacks that got the mannequins. Um, <laughs> yes, your question. I thought that you gave the character the accent so that you could create the subtitles. No, no. That's what I got. Yeah, no, the original... Yeah, the original reason was just like I said, I was trying to do Forrest, evil Forrest Gump. That was that was just what I was trying to do. Like it ended up being apparently everyone tells you well, that's what Sling Blade is is evil Forrest Gump, so it just ended up being Sling Blade. This is the part where you pretend that you played it from the beginning. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I, I, I swear to God, I still haven't seen that movie though. But yeah. <laughs> so I have two questions. Yeah. I didn't. I was in class. I didn't yeah. really see. But um, my first one is like, what horror mo what horror movies kind of inspire you? Mm -hmm. I guess. Yeah. Well, is that the first question? That's the first question. Okay, yeah, the first question, first question is, so there's an enormous amount of horror movies I watch, and it kind of depends what sort of genre I'm in. 
uh, or genre of horror I'm doing, because obviously there's different types of horror movies, there's zombie movies, there's slash movies, all that stuff, and I like a lot of that stuff. The stuff that inspires me as a filmmaker um, tends to be the more dream, dreamy stuff, so David Lynch, again, as I said, is a huge, huge influence on me. Um, his movie, particularly Lost Highway, um, I don't know if you guys have seen that. That's that. I have the Yellow Man is basically a direct. It's supposed to be a tip of the hat, and <laughs> we'll see how people take that. But it's supposed to be like a call out to David Lynch, because uh, there's a scene where a character that kind of looks like a Yellow Man walks around with a camera, um, and um, so that was one. His film. Um, also, I don't know if you guys ever watched Twin Peaks, the original Twin Peaks with yes. the dream sequence. Mm -hmm. Have you guys ever seen that? The uh, oh, maybe if we have a minute after this, we can show them that you kind of get. The back we're talking, man. Oh yeah. Well, yeah, yeah, That's the Red Room, just that because it's only like five minutes long. But that that was a that was like a very profound moment for me when I saw that. Um, you know, outside of, yeah, outside of David Lynch, um, David Cronenberg, like I said, Videodrome is a really big one. I'm a really big fan of. Um, just, just like like Terry Gill like guys you wouldn't be surprised of Terry Gilliam. Oh, that's what I was gonna say. That head, that's yeah, like, like Monty Python, like yeah, yeah, all Brazil, that stuff. like Brazil. Advent Adventures of Baron Moonchild and <laughs> stuff like that. He doesn't really do horror at all. He does kind of fan funny fantasy yeah. movies typically, but I'm a really big fan of his. Um, it's funny because like a lot of the films we wouldn't typically classify as horror films outside of the David Cronenberg films that I'm I'm really influenced by, um, but it would say just like weird, uh, weird. Films. Uh -huh. <laughs> I, guess, I guess it would be. I watched a film recently that I really loved called, um, <laughs> which is a very, very uh, potentially offensive film. In fact, you guys are squeamish at all about um, insane, uh, very, very offensive sex scenes, uh, particularly for religious. But a movie called The Devils, which is uh, oh, so good, it's so good. But yeah, if you're if you're at all um, of religious persuasions, you might and it's sensitive oh, that you might not want the it. The Devils was banned for. Like 25 years, yeah. only just recently. If it, I have it on a hard drive, if, if you ever want to see this thing, it is amazing. My friend bought a bootleg copy of the director's cut version of it. Um, <laughs> but that film's like really wacky and surreal and out there too, and that, like stuff like that tends to be what I, what I really like. Um, yeah. Oh, you pull, oh, this is good. Yeah, we can play that at the end so you can kind of see my... Uh, and you had a second question. Oh, yeah, sorry, yeah, the second question. I was going to ask, this is more general. Um, yeah. How do you go about marketing? Good question. <laughs> Good question. I'll tell you when I figure that out. So, <laughs> I'm really bad at that. Uh, yeah. So I don't get a. Um, I mean, the way you market your movies, it's so hard. I mean, I work in marketing, and it's um, it's really hard. I'm be honest with you guys. When you make independent films and you don't have budgets behind you, the entire thing is basically just organic social media, trying to get you know get a Facebook presence, get a Twitter presence. You try to do PR, and launch yourself out to. Um, various um, blogs and things like that to try to get them to review the film. A lot of times they won't. Um, so it's not easy. I don't have a good answer for you, unfortunately. Well, may, it's just, may I jump in here? Yeah, so yeah. Charles and I met at the Chain Film Festival in New yeah. York City, and he is, did it three years in a row. I did it three yeah. three alternating years. Mm -hmm. um, and that's that's actually, like yeah. I, the only way that I know Charles at all yeah. is because his film and mine screened in the same yeah. film festival. And that that's a big part of coming out. Like you were yep. in uh, what was it? Uh, New York New York Film New York Festival. Festival. Um, and so there's like everybody knows about Sundance and Cannes yeah. and Berlin and Toronto, the big ones. You're not gonna get into but, this. But unless you have like a really hot film. Yeah. yeah. But there's a, there's a lot of great filmmaking <laughs> opportunities out there. There's yeah. a lot of great market out there. Yeah. Um, and like we were talking about downstairs, Chain, we've both shown a chain three times, they're very loyal to their filmmaking. Yeah. Um, yep. Same with like, Newark. Yeah, same with Newark. Yep. Same with um, some of the other ones. A lot of film festivals. Yeah, because there's um, different tier. Well, I'm sorry to interrupt, but like with the film festivals, um, it's a good place to go to, particularly. I think a lot of people go in. I was saying you're not going to get into those. I wasn't trying to be pessimistic. You know, you, you very well might, but it's <laughs> when you get into those really, really big film festivals like that, you, the cards are so extremely stacked against you, just be forewarned, because um, you can sometimes throw away a lot of money trying to get into like, your tips and your Sundances and stuff like that, and even those mid-sized film festivals, because it's basically like, unless your film is about the message they're, they're, they want to have their films about that year, or if it's not, it has a celebrity in it, but you have to have massive budgets behind you, or you have the right you, who you know, like it's really hard to get into them. You can sometimes, particularly if it's short films, you have a better chance with feature length films. It gets really hard if you have like no celebrities and it's like something weird, right? Yeah. <laughs> I'm, gonna undercut, I'm gonna undercut my friend Charles yeah. here slightly and say that as students at Lesley University, a huge part of my job mm -hmm. is building partnerships with film festivals and yeah. opportunities for you. Use that. So, yeah. um, two major film festivals, uh, sorry, three major film mm -hmm. festivals in the like New England regional area are partnering with Leslie. Oh, that's the, great. The dean is actually going to fund us to start our own, um, which we'll talk about yeah. soon. So, yes, Charles is right. Like, 
if you want to be in Sundance, you got to have a major name actor. But my job mm -hmm. and the reason you guys are here to be successful filmmakers is to create opportunities, maybe not on the Sundance level, mm -hmm. but on a more regional level with um, some major, major festivals yep. that, um, like, like I just made a partnership with one last week where you can all submit for free to a uh, major film festival. So yeah. um, that's, a, that's a big deal because if you use this, like seriously, while you're here, I, I can't use this because I'm not a student, but <laughs> seriously, this is like one of the hardest things to do is get into film festivals. But when the one with film festival, one thing to keep in mind on film festivals is that some people, when you're first starting out, are gonna tell you only submit to the big ones because that's where the marketplaces are. And what we mean by marketplaces is places you can sell your movie to distributors, right? Because mm -hmm. that, but here's the thing. If you're making like a, a, a low budget under $10,000 like feature film, I would almost say don't go with the distributor unless they're like a serious distributor that's gonna put you in theaters because a lot of that stuff is just gonna end up going direct to streaming, which you frankly can do yourself. Yeah. You don't need to have it. You, with Amazon Video, which is where <laughs> Eddie Clum's available right now, you can just, it's like uploading a YouTube video and you can sell it to people directly. And I would say you only go to the distributor in that instance if um, they have a good marketing plan for you, they have money to put behind you for the marketing of the film, they can get you into theaters, things like that. Most time that's not gonna be it. So the point of film festivals in that instance is that it's a marketing tool. You meet people, you get awards, you can have a bunch of accolades. I'll tell you right now, when I won awards, I have films that have won awards and films that haven't, the ones that have won awards that I can post that little little stamp on the poster when I put it up on like Amazon Video, get more views than the ones that don't. Um, typically, you know, there's a million different reasons why something, but you know, so the small ones are worth it. Even particularly when you're first like starting out with your super low budget stuff. Yeah. You know? Of all the film festivals I've been in, there are I can name on three fingers the best positive things that came out of them. I met Charles. He's awesome. <laughs> I met Federico. Yes. At a film festival, um, and I got distribution. Um, no, no. But. It's really about shaking hands. It's really about building your network. Federico is here because I was in that film festival and he was in that film festival and he's awesome and he's great. And, yeah. You know, he's one of our professors. And yeah. but like Charles is sitting right here because yeah, like Kirk and Christina thought we would yeah. be good together. And there's also good publicity. So you know, you get a film out how marketing it. You, you want to get interviewed. You want to get people to write about your stuff. When you go to some of these film festivals or the Newark Film Newark Film Festival, they had a whole line of. Um, <coughs> You're walking down the red carpet and you get into the opening party. And this is a newer film festival. They had local press. They do interviews with you. They post those online. Like that. It's that's how you do it. It's not. You know. The reality is, if you have a, if you want to like go like super with your film and like get like you know the big viewership, you need you need some kind of a budget typically, unless you tap in to stumble upon something that's like really really buzzy, like a paranormal activity or something that just happens to take off. Most of the time, you need like media buying. You need to buy ads. You need to buy stuff like that. And that's a lot harder when you're. Starting out, a lot of that comes from if you have a distribution deal, if you can get a good distribution deal, they'll have a budget set aside for you. But most of the time, if you're super low budget, they won't. So, yeah, Daniel, yeah, um, it's a three part short question. Mm -hmm. Um, when he asked to turn the camera off, yeah, did he hit her? Well, I'm not telling you because, <laughs> she, was, no, because she was like this after the yeah. camera back on. I don't know, I just like, oh, yeah, well, it's your, that's your, it's your, okay. yeah, not I'm not telling her. you, you have to figure it out yourself. <laughs> okay, he you did not. Okay. <laughs> okay. Eddie, Eddie's a totally good guy. He's a totally good guy. Yeah. What are you talking about? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah, he loves the baby, okay. No. <laughs> I love that part one, part two. Okay, okay. part two. Um, how did you get to shoot the those scenes when he was outside, when it was raining, or when he was like, there was like, I mean, it's a very populated area, obviously, like in the movie it was empty, that because there was no movement, nobody was like, you know, coming out of the windows, or there's no movement, you know, like in the houses um, around. Oh, the empty neighborhood. Oh, like yeah. when I was outside? Yeah, when you were outside, um, yeah. So that was just blind, that was just waiting. <laughs> that was just <laughs> sitting and waiting for no traffic or no people to be standing in windows or filming in the middle of the night. And you basically just go out and stand around and like, oh, freak, your oh, neighbors right. freak your neighbors out. Oh yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. There, there wasn't really a secret. You just you, it's a, there's a, so many takes you did where like even indoors we'll be filming and then a car will drive past the window. And we're like, all right, we have to stop okay. and redo that take because you know. I'll tell you which take do you think not because of the cars but took the most to how took the most shots to shoot? You might have a guess. The little wagon. No. No. Breastfeeding the baby. <gasps> Because we couldn't stop laughing. No, well, that's <laughs> what we were. We were and laughing. by the way, that's my cousin. No who did that. Okay. I, I literally okay. asked the web. This is one thing you're doing really weird, messed up stuff. <laughs> it is really hard to find people. I asked probably six or seven different people to do it, and then no one would agree to do it. Even people were like, I'll do it. And then, like, okay, we're filming tomorrow. They're like, I can't. I can't. I can't, do it. I can't. <laughs> so, and I was getting to the point where I was like, all right, I'm going to. 
because I was at the point where I was like, I'm gonna green screen myself. <laughs> I'll be the baby. I'm just like wear a wig or make it like meta where he's like breastfeeding himself and it'd be some weird thing. Uh-huh. And my wife is like, this is going to look terrible. You're not going to be able to pull us off. She's like, call your cousin because he's like I really a weird stuff. really watching Lenny and Maddie who didn't see the film try to figure out what Yeah. Was. And then he finally gave up and he was like, yeah, yeah, I'll call totally, you can totally breastfeed it. And then, yeah, but like, I couldn't, I couldn't get the... You know, <laughs> what's it? You, you Boom, baby, drink some milk. Like, <laughs> like, like, couldn't, <laughs> couldn't, couldn't, that was like, like literally probably about ten takes for no other reason than we just couldn't stop laughing. <laughs> but, yeah. Sorry, was, can yeah, I ask, yeah, like, yeah. So, was it, why was the purpose of, like, like, in the middle of the first act scene, changing the colors from your point of view? Oh, yeah, that was, yeah. In the In the ending scene? No, the, the first act scene. <clears throat> oh, yeah, 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 yeah. It was kind um, of, like, yeah, well, he's holding it's a different perspective. I'm trying to convey that as a different perspective. You're saying who's holding the well, camera, right? Because one of the questions I want you to be asking is who's uh, the camera? Who's and then the question in the end right, you'll notice yeah. is was there ever a camera to begin with? Because you notice he's sitting in the chair and yeah. he's just holding nothing. Yeah, yeah so that's one of the things I want you to think about is how how was early, there ever how early in this film yeah. did you become aware of the camera? Just, um, for me, it was about halfway through. I'm just curious about you guys. Like, how early did you start thinking about like I, who's filming this thing? Well, yeah. I mean, like uh, he was sort of like giving a tour of his, of his house yeah. at the beginning. When, so. you, when it started off, like what what did you think of in terms of like camera use and storytelling? Like what kind? What what would you compare it to? Documentary. Yeah, like documentary, like yeah. reality yeah. TV. It felt like reality TV, yeah. But then they like also TV. felt like the trailer to uh, the Psycho uh, to uh, yeah. Well, just by a show of hands, how yeah. many of you got to a point where you're like, wait, who is running the camera? Did anybody ever ask that question? Um. Yeah. Oh Again, how early in the film did you ask that question? I saw the foot on the door. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So trying to kick the foot open. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah that's, that's kind of once you see the foot ta- and start tapping and the character on the shoulder. I thought Ooh. I thought that um, whoever whoever was holding the camera probably because you know they they didn't talk at all and we see later on why. But I also thought that maybe their arms were missing or something and that mm-hmm. the you know the camera was somehow like strapped onto the arm. Mm-hmm. Because because uh, it was weird how you know he, he was using his foot instead of his hand and, and he, his actually and then his hands were tied together when you see him. I okay, so how was how was he holding the camera? Kills him at an up side, but his hands were duct taped together. <coughs> how many of you had like a, like a grand reveal moment where you were just like, oh, this is different than I've seen. Bobby was tasty too. <laughs> <laughs> right off the bat, it was pretty different from other stuff. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I liked your shot where you had uh, the bait, you know, in the uh, in the wagon. You mm-hmm. had that shot where you get in the back of him and you hear like, and it's yep. like, I don't know. How did you do that? Where After Effects? After Effects? Yeah, oh, so that, that was, was all, yeah, yeah. I knew that was After Effects. That, that the yeah, shot green though, screen. was that that was that was all green screen. No, just green screen. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So by the way, my green screen okay. is uh, you guys have a bigger green screen than me. I painted my garage. I live. I own a house. We filmed in my house. And uh, my garage, I painted from floor to ceiling, just green screen green. Yeah. FYI, you don't need to get the actual expensive chrome green seventy-five dollars of bucket stuff. If you get this thing called Apple uh, or sparkling apple green from Home Depot, it costs twenty-five dollars a bucket. Works just as well. Mm. But as I've well, discovered, I mean, I've done it with without any yeah. color that you can isolate. Like yeah, we, we it, did it, a project where yeah. everybody was wearing green. So yeah. we actually use orange as the background. Yeah, anything nice. that you can just isolate. Yeah, yeah, exactly. That's the one thing they'll try to trick you. Yeah, you can like you get to buy the seventy-five yeah. dollar a bucket, like you know, gallon, like you don't. Too. No. Yeah, but we, we do buy this. But we do. You're going to call it funny. Noah's got a question. <laughs> yes, yes. No. We actually, you sort of, uh, you sort of answered this earlier, but uh, mm-hmm. but uh, well, well, sort of a two-part question. Uh, first, uh, where did you get the uh, the funding for this? And, and second, mm-hmm. uh, what was your pr- uh, process for finding actors and crew? Yeah, so funding was just my own bank account. Um, well, what uh, was the, the budget? Movie, the movie only cost a thousand dollars to make. Mm-hmm. Um, one and thousand? yeah, one thousand. Yeah. So I mean, it's it. Um, I already owned the camera. I already owned the lights and all that. So there was some stuff, you know, if you added it all up, maybe it deflate to like two or three thousand uh, dollars. You know, I'd say, but all my movies that I made have been under five thousand, ten thousand um, dollars, mm-hmm. which, by the way, isn't rare. That's that's pretty normal um, these days. You you don't need um, <coughs> millions of dollars to make a feature film. It's it's really with with the technology. And my camera, I'm using. We purposely we used the T4i, which is and we cranked it all because we want to move the, the footage to look bad because you want to look like you found some like you know camera in the pop okay. right so that's why we crank the lighting <laughs> all the way up and filmed really dark because we want lots of grain stuff like that but like you can buy you know you know you can buy 
top of the line DSLR from Canon for like five thousand dollars now. You know, you as opposed to like fifty thousand dollars like it used to be when you're so as digital filmmakers, you know, you really we filmed a movie I just shot. We filmed it all on a GoPro in four K um, hmm. with a Karma Grip Steadicam. You know, um, so yeah, uh, yeah. It, it, it's just I have a day job, and that, that's just how I fund it. So it wasn't huge. Um, and then your other question was, how do you? Like, like when you found like the the cast and the crew. Oh, uh, yeah. You said you said your cousin was one of the. Uh, yeah, the yeah. A lot of it was just my well, people I've worked with before. This, as I said, this is my fourth film. So um, Hope, the lady who plays Diane, she's been in every one of my movies um, as the lead actress. So she was she helped produce this one too. And then um, it was just people we know, other filmmakers. I know the guy who gets torn apart in the yard, Ron. Ah, 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 that keeps going on forever. Um, he's been in every one of my films too, and he's and he's also like a camera guy. And then my friend, and he, he's a filmmaker as well. I've acted in his movies. And then we have um, Todd, who plays the um, postal man. Hi, hey friend. How you doing? He's um, he's a filmmaker as well. Um, and he was he actually had a film that screened here in Boston at the Boston LGBT Film Festival. It was really oh, we wait, filmed. Todd who? Brennan. Yeah, so how many of you have taken the, the history of the moving image? James Endo was the director of the Boston LGBT. Oh, really? Yeah, he was in 2014? 2014? Yeah, so, yeah. Yeah. yeah, it was a great film. We actually shot that in the middle of Prospect Park about um, unrelated. It was, it, it's called Picking Up. I don't think you can get it anywhere, unfortunately, but it's a really funny short film about um, uh, gay men who, who uh, hook up in the middle of Prospect Park. And then... Um, but one of them's an environmentalist and is having an existential crisis because it's like they leave all this detritus on the floor after they have sex, like you don't use condom wrappers and stuff. And he's but like, <laughs> like I need to have sex with an environmental friendly person. It was really funny. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> um, should we watch anyway, this? Sorry, should we watch this Peaks? Well, did you? You looked like oh, you sorry, had a question. I just, it looked like there were some other questions for. Yes. I just I have to run, but I want to know if there's anywhere I can like watch it since yes. I missed it. Well, Amazon Video. Would, would, Amazon would, Video. Would, would you? How much is it? Yeah, um, so if you have Prime, it's free. You can either rent yes. it, um, though if you don't have Prime, you can rent it for um, three or four dollars. You can buy it for ten dollars. Oh. Oh, okay. Would you be open to making it available to the Leslie community for a short period of time yeah. through our internal network? Sure. Okay. So, yeah. or you can just watch it on Prime. If you have Prime, you just watch it for free. Yeah. Too, if, you have, so. if you have Prime, watch it for yeah. free. I um, I'll figure out how to use a uh, My Leslie to make it available for everyone. Okay. Um, for yeah. you know, just a short window, so yeah. that anybody who wasn't here can see it. Yeah. Um, you tell should... your friends, leave a review online if you like. Yeah. It. <laughs> <laughs> Other questions? Yeah. There's, yeah. Was the, was the movie itself in the Amazon box that was delivered to the house? No. Oh. Was the movie itself in the Amazon? Oh, that's an interesting. Uh, oh, yeah. I see what you're saying. That's interesting. Uh, I didn't think about that. That's very interesting. Uh, that's a good idea. I didn't think about that. Yeah. <laughs> How many days did you take to shoot? Oh, yeah. So we filmed on weekends um, over probably a two-month period. I want to say it was probably in total, all in all, probably 17, 14 to 17 days. Oh, yeah, okay. It was typical. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. How did you light it? How did I light it? <laughs> so um, I have the, uh, it depends what scene we're in. Um, when we were filming in the house, it was a lot of, I mean, we used a lot of just lights and light bulbs, but also that effect that um, where you see the lines from the window, that was a giant, that was just a big tungsten light that I just had on a on a stand that just shines at the window. Um, and then uh, everywhere else, it was a lot of just looking at the natural light and just sort of, just turn off that light bulb, but turn on that one. I went through my house and unscrewed um, a bunch of light bulbs so that, like, you could get silhouettes in certain areas and not in other areas I of darkness. I there were some scenes yeah. where it felt like the camera Oh yeah, so that's true too. Yeah, yeah. So there were, we had a light on top of the camera as well, oh, okay. so that worked. Because I, I like that because I wanted to look like like that documentary. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. Uh, the lights on like on the angels' faces uh, was that like an LED thing, or did you do that in post? Uh, no, that was all After Effects. Oh, okay. That was all After Effects. Yeah. Uh, yep. I didn't honestly. That was my first experience with After Effects. I didn't use trackers. I actually went frame by frame and reproduced. Oh jeez. And it was <laughs> a, yeah. I've learned better since then. Sorry. So, that's yeah. Not it took way longer than it should have. Um, so uh, <laughs> I think we have time for like two more questions, and then um, yeah, thank you for coming. Mm. One more question. Go on, somebody has to ask you. You have to ask two more. Yeah, I think it's a really good one. So um, 
how far did you shoot the ISO on those really noisy scenes? And what was the standard yeah. when he was just sitting in the rocking the chair? I just crank it up as high as it possibly. I don't. I can't remember exactly okay. off the top of my head what it was. We just. It was just sort of. Let's we see. looked through the view screen and it's like that looks really bad. Let's <laughs> let's, <laughs> let's, let's do that more. T4I, <laughs> yeah, it was a T4i, so it's yeah, like a really low. Like Sixty-four hundred or something like. Ridiculous. Yeah, yeah. So I just cranked it all the way up, and then we just tried to make everything as dark as we possibly can, because we wanted as much crappy grain as we could. Um, it's a, the alien, what did you use? Uh, like, what were the lights? How did you get, like... Those are just lens flares. Lens flares? Lens flares after That's effect. not yeah. the best question to ask, yeah. though. But the thing about, what was the concept of the... Were they um, a part of the bigger... You know, were they a part of, like, what like they were saying? Like, did they actually come out of that thing? Yep. Well, um, as, as he explains, oh, they, they burst out. They burst so you have out. all the wounds okay. on the giant, they burst out of her. Okay. Mm -hmm. For me, yeah. that's, that's my favorite scene when he comes up the hill and we, mm -hmm. we hear the giant screaming, but we when we see the giant for the first time, that was the moment where I was just like, mm -hmm. "Wow, we're doing something <laughs> really different, different right?" Yeah. yeah. Um, Feels yeah. like cosmic that, horror. That scene was really exciting. Did you have a question? Oh, uh, uh, I, uh, well, was was there any like inspiration from any kind of like mythology? You know, it's a good question. Um, not really mythology. I think a lot of inspiration for me came from uh, just my personal life initially. If I had to, I, I, so when I come up with things like this, um, I don't really have a linear story in my head. It just sort of flashes of images, mm -hmm. and I just sort of I don't write anything down. I just start writing, and I have these flashes of images in my mind, and we see what happens. Um, I a lot of stuff had been happening in my life at the time, which I think contributed to it. So, for instance, I just had. Uh, my daughter was just born and she had called for the first three months of her life so she was just screaming over and over and over again for three months straight mm. and then uh, the way you, you appease her is you constantly have to feed her and feed and you know my wife had to like constantly like feed her milk and everything like that so i think oh, that's yeah. sort of how a lot of that kind of worked its way in I, it wasn't like intentionally meant to be an allegory for that but uh, i think that's sort of where these images in my mind sort baby. of like symbolically came from like the baby <laughs> A oh, screaming mother question. that won't stop screaming. You have to feed them. You have to feed them. I also had a thing too where I got into weightlifting a lot, and so I was constantly eating chicken. So that's where the whole thing about eating chickens came from. By the way, hmm. uh, the reason we use the cats, well, those are my cats, because I couldn't find a place to actually just rent me a chicken for a day. You can either <laughs> oh. buy a chicken, or you can do not have a chicken. There's no place where you can just be like, can I just have a chicken for one, <laughs> like an hour, just so I can get one shot. There's no place that will let you do that. You have to just buy an entire chicken. And I was oh. like, I'm not buying an entire live chicken, so we just went with my cats. <laughs> yes. So who's Kathy? Oh. You tell me. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> I had one person um, contact me. I got a, it's funny, here's one thing you'll learn when you start putting your stuff online too. Um, if you go on my Amazon video reviews, it's it, it like a, it's had one, one good review, two bad reviews, but I've gotten like six fan letters. Well, so you should know, because hmm. I don't know if you know mm -hmm. this. I took the good review and put it on one of the promotional posters for, Strange. for tonight. <laughs> the, the one that was like, um, what did it say? Like, if you want a Hollywood film with a oh, spoof ending. Oh, Steve. Yeah. Stein sign maker Steve. Yeah, he's one of my fans. <laughs> Steve. Yeah, I just, yeah. That's he, on the poster that's hanging yeah. in the hallway. Yeah, that's great. But, um. Gotta love Steve. Yeah, yeah, yeah. When you're, when you're a small fry like me, you get to know all your fans on a first name basis. There's Steve, there's Kathleen. <laughs> oh, oh, maybe no, but I have, a, I have a person write me a fan mail. Because this is one thing you'll notice is that when you leave on the Amazon reviews, only the people who don't like your movie typically leave your reviews. The people who actually like you take the extra effort to like write you, just write you letters, which is very sweet. But the end result is you have these low scores. So what can you do? But, um, <laughs> but um, she wrote me a letter and was like, "How did you get my name to appear?" Her name was Kathy, mm -hmm. and she watched the movie. She's like, "How did you get my name to appear?" Like she thought, like I, I oh, like yeah. quoted it, so like the film was showing her name personally, and I was like, "That's really cool." And I just went with it. I said, or I wrote back, "You're in a coma, cat, and I've been trying to contact you." That's funny. <laughs> oh, yes, That's funny. fourth dimensional horror. Yeah. That needs cool. to be a thing. That was cool. <laughs> the yep. scene with the box when it went like dark and then yep. came back. And the hand that, came out. Was that? Did you do that on the camera? Or was that after? After. Nice. I mean, that was a little combination. Looks like it was shot somewhere else. Hmm? For the hand. Looks like it was shot no, separately. No, no, just the, like, turning of the thing, like, dark. Oh, yeah, no, that was mostly, that was, like, premiere and after effects. The, the, we filmed the oh, hand okay. coming out in a closet. I stood in the closet mm. and reached my hand up. <laughs> like, oh. right. Should we do this Twin Peaks? Yeah, we can do this Twin Peaks. So, um, I want, yeah, we can probably turn off the camera because I'm sure there's some sort of, like. Yeah, it's fine. I won't get it later. So, um, we'll this scene. We'll fix it in post. So, this Twin Peaks, <laughs> like I said, this is a huge, it's a TV show. You guys probably, they just did a. Yeah, I watched the it. last one. 
Yeah, so this is from the original one in like 1990, nice. um, and this Better. is the third episode. I won't ruin anything for you, but basically the story is. I hope I got the right scene. Uh, no, you have the Cooper's, Cooper's, Cooper's dream. dream. Yeah. Cooper's dream. Yeah. So there's a there's a FBI agent, and he's really um, he's like he's a really eccentric guy. He's all into like Zen Buddhism and like dream interpretation and stuff like that, and he's trying to solve. Um, a case of a, of a girl who was murdered. Is he Laura Palmer. Palmer. And in the third season, he has a dream, and to help, he like goes to sleep to try to dream of what what the answer is uh, of who killed her. And this is the dream sequence, and it's um the first. It's only like what was it ten, minutes. five minutes long, Four something minutes like long. that. It is. I'd say the when I watched it, I watched it in my twenties, and it was a really profound. The thing I would say is that this was sort of like the first time I saw a color I didn't know existed in terms of just what you could do. With this stuff, and it was very influential on me. And you can, I think, you can kind of well, see this, it a little bit. This happened so. when I was in high school. Yeah. And all I'll say, everything Charles said is totally true. What I would say yeah. is, up until this episode, so the third episode. Yeah. And the first episode, it's two hours long. It's a two-hour pilot. Yeah. It's, I would call it like a weird cop drama. Yeah. It's good, but it, it, it gets. It's, it's just like a soap it, opera it, it, it about a cop trying different. to solve a crime. Is, oh, love, yeah. is Cooper the guy from Dune? Yeah. 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 Yes. Also a David Lynch movie. Yeah. Also yeah. David Lynch. Okay. Movie. So, so, so imagine, yeah. imagine yeah. watching yeah. like, yeah. like Law and Order, and then suddenly this. And happens. then suddenly this happens. Yeah. <laughs> and he's asleep, and this suddenly cuts to his dream. He's asleep. Yeah. Ah, the mule wash is dying too. Come back in style. She's my cousin. But doesn't she work? Almost like that, he's doing wash for Palmer. But it, it is for a Palmer. Are you Laura Palmer? Hey, feel like I know her. But sometimes my arms bend. She's really doing fish dress. Why we from the first thing a brush is hung? And there's a voice music in the air.
So, so you guys, uh, these are some of my influences going around. <laughs> and that's amazing. And but imagine, so you guys are all too young to remember when we only had three TV stations, <laughs> and like prime time, nine o'clock at night on like a Tuesday, yeah. you tune into like the weird on ABC. On ABC, <laughs> you turn into like the weird soap opera show about like the FBI guy who's kind of weird but trying to solve like a pretty straightforward murder, yeah. and then you see that. I mean, like, what is it, 1990? Yeah. yeah. Like, yeah. Right. Yeah, life-changing. Um, let's all have a round of applause for Mr. Charles. Dave. Thank, thank you. Thank you for coming out. Thank you for coming out. Yeah. Thank you for sharing your film. Absolutely, anytime. Um, <laughs> <laughs> we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna wrap it up. You guys can get out of here if you want to ask Charles any more questions. He's gonna be around, um, and uh, you know, use this wisely. Do good stuff. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Ah, they're yours. <laughs> well, yeah, yeah, I have a social. Uh, if you guys want to follow me on Facebook, it's Chunkle Freaky. That's right. Freaky. I'm also on Instagram and Twitter. Can you Uncle tell us you blame Chunkle Freaky? Oh, yeah, so our name used to be um, Uncle Creepy's Movies. Uh, <laughs> and then I went to go form an LLC, and uh, the name had already been taken. So I had to, I had to you know, um, uh, so we had to think of a different name. And my cut, my nephew calls me Chunkle, thanks to my sister, because um, Charles' uncle, so she's like, call him Chunkle. Um, oh, and Chunkle so, Freaky's Movies, right? Yeah, Chunkle Freaky's Movies. Um, and so then my brother, when, when I couldn't use this, we were trying to think of a name, my brother said, well, Chunkle Freaky. It's like Uncle Creek, but it's Chunkle Freaky. And I was like, yeah, that's good. We'll do it that. <laughs> So. Hey, your logo's that so face nice. that appeared nice. in the movie. Absolutely, thanks for coming. <laughs> yeah, 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 that's my <laughs> wife's drawing, yeah. I used, to, we had, I, used to, I used to be a photographer, I still don't have so time to do it anymore. I had a model originally for it, but I was like, it doesn't convey chunkle freaky. I think I kind of like it more. I used to be Uncle Creepy just because it's sort of like a risque thing to call your movie, yeah. or a movie company, Uncle Paul oh, wow. movies. But um, I like Chuckle Freaky because it's sort of like a character, sort of like Eddie from Iron Man or something. I think it's actually cool. Uncle yeah. 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 Freaky is kind of like, yeah. uh, I saw that at the... the, the yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. 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 yeah, everyone has one. But not everyone yeah. has a chunkle freaky. Yeah. Yeah. Chunkle freaky. Yeah. Chunkle freaky. Yeah. Chunkle freaky. Yeah. Yeah. Chunkle freaky. 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 <laughs> today. Well, so that where you got you, you started writing your script, right? Did you say at the mm-hmm. burrito place? You were writing. You no, that's a, no. It was not, yeah, no, yeah. I was having after we finished my last movie, we saw 